it's time for us to check back in with the people and their quilts and see what John Rice talks about next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. Maddie Carter's Rye Cove, Virginia quilt. Lily Caldonia Van Diventer Hicks made this quilt as a young lady at her home in Dryden, Virginia, probably in the 1890s. Since she had no children, it was passed on to her sister, Maddie Van Diventer Carter. Maddie lived four miles up the valley from the historic village of Clinchport, Virginia, near Rye Cove. She was a school teacher, an artist, and a kindly lady from whom I purchased two pioneer log houses and numerous antiques. One of Maddie's daughters was the victim of one of the most renowned natural disasters which ever occurred in southwest Virginia. In May 1929, a cyclone swept through Ryko Valley and devastated the small two-story schoolhouse. A fire immediately broke out, caused by an overturned heating stove, and most of the 155 students and eight teachers were entrapped. Fifty-four of the children were seriously injured, and 13 were killed, including Maddie's young daughter. One person who witnessed the storm was the now legendary songwriter A.P. Carter. He helped rescue the survivors and soon thereafter wrote The Cyclone of Rye Cove, a song which helped launch the famous singing Carter family. The quilt now belongs to Maddie's other daughter, Rosemary Carter Miller, who lives on a part of the old home place. The quilt blocks are pieced and are similar to the buggy wheel pattern. The melon border is applique. Nanny Brown's Shirt Factory, Lone Star, the superstitious quilt. Various shirt factories in small towns of the southern Appalachian region were known for their very low pay and for the long, arduous labor they demanded from their employees. It was not considered proper for these factories to give their cloth scraps to the employees. They chose rather to dump them in the trash pile at the back of the plants to be hauled off and destroyed. Anyone could raid the scrap pile of these factories and salvage bits and pieces for the purpose of making quilts. The pieces from which this quilt was made were discarded scraps from the shirt factory in Sparta, Tennessee. The quilt was made by Nanny Brown, sister of Pauline Brown Lay, shown at left, and mother of Chris Keyes. Chris, who now owns the quilt and is shown at the right, remembers when her mother gave it to her. Mother saved the scraps from the shirt factory there in Sparta for a long time and pieced this Lone Star pattern. You could go there and get them the scraps where they had thrown them out. People still do that, I think. People that quilt. That was when I was in high school and I liked it so much that she said she'd give it to me when we got it quilted. Well, when she decided to give it to me, she had to put some other pattern along with the main star. People said that if you made a lone star and gave it away, it would bring bad luck to the person you gave it to. Old people would never give you a lone star quilt if there was no other pattern on the quilt. That's why she put the little stars up there in the corner. She did that before she would ever give it to me because she was afraid that it would bring me bad luck if she didn't. She embroidered my name on it and I didn't realize that until after she died. She wanted to make sure I got it. And that was her last one, photographed by the author. Pap's Striped Suit Quilt. It was a cold, snowy day in January 1983 when I happened to call my mother, Ruth Rice Irwin. She suggested I come over as my dad was pacing the floor and wishing someone would come by for a visit. I went, and a few minutes later, we were upstairs looking at all the colorful ancestral quilts which Mother had kept most carefully packed away in the cedar chest which her father had made for her. We unfolded each one and admired the bright patterns and meticulous workmanship. Just before leaving, I decided to explore the unfloored section of the upstairs, an area over the kitchen. There were the usual old suits, discarded suitcases, and several of my old army uniforms. Then I saw an old tack quilt or comforter hanging from a rough bracing timber. I brought it out to the daylight. No colorful pattern nor careful stitching here, just a heavy utility or everyday comforter, not even technically qualifying as a quilt. That's why it hung openly among the dirt dauber and wasp nest and did not merit being packed away in the cedar chest. Mother remembered it immediately. 
That's an old everyday quilt Granny Irwin made, she said. As we were examining the various materials, my father said, Why, there's my suit, pointing to a piece of fine striped woolen cloth. He vividly recalled the story of the hand-me-down clothes. Lawrence Sharp was a good deal older than me, and he left home and was working up north, Kokomo, Indiana, I think it was. Well, he made good money, but spent most of it for expensive clothes. He'd buy a high-priced suit of clothes and come back home every once in a while. And one time, he'd come in wearing this suit. Well, Lidge, my father's older brother, liked it so well that he bought it. He wore it a few years. It finally got too little for him, and he gave it to me, and I wore that suit three or four years till it got too small for me. That was about the prettiest suit I ever had. Everybody talked about what a pretty suit it was. I remember that Oat Stooksbury out there had an old T-model truck, and he took a big load of people up to Blue Mud to some sort of rally, and I went along. Everybody talked about what a fine suit of clothes that was. That's been, I guess, well over 60 years ago. It is not known whether or not my father's younger brother, Morrill, wore the suit, but what is quite evident is that Granny Irwin garnered this and other old garments probably before 1920 and made them into this heavy quilt, which was itself used almost half a century. I'm quite certain that my brother David and I used it throughout our childhood, for we always slept in unheated rooms. This quilt weighs in an unbelievable nine and one-half pounds. It is tacked or tied and has no quilting. The cotton padding is lumpy and has bunched up in certain areas because of the lack of quilting. The back of the quilt is made of fertilized sacks and it measures 66 inches by 84 inches. Numerous quilt signs along the highways and back roads of southern Appalachia serve as reminders of the remaining and growing interest in handmade quilts. This sign on Indian Fork Creek near the Tennessee-North Carolina border in Unicoi County, Tennessee does not indicate how far up the dirt road the quilter lives. The purpose of the propped pole at the bridge is to divert logs and other heavy debris away from the center bridge support during flooding. Without it, a large log could knock out the support and thus destroy the bridge. Spring Quilt Sunning on a late spring afternoon in a rocky valley on the Tennessee-Virginia line, a lone quilt hangs among other bed covers, giving color to the otherwise austere surroundings. A young mother, followed by her daughter, returns to their home after having walked down to the public road. The custom of airing and sunning quilts in the early spring and after a winter's use may be as old as the quilt itself. The Quilt Today there is a phenomenal revival of interest in quilts in America today, which is reflected in numerous magazine articles. The airline magazine, American Way, recently devoted a cover to quilts, and in the accompanying article, Elizabeth C. Mooney mentions a New York shop which recently made a quilt for a customer for $13,000. She goes on to point out that a biblical quilt made by a black slave hangs in a Smithsonian Institution gallery, that the Metropolitan Museum of Art recently exhibited its selection of the 12 finest quilts in America, and that President Reagan sent a patchwork quilt as a present to the new heir to the British throne. Quilts were mentioned on a recent cover of one of the nation's most popular home and garden magazines, and inside 46 quilts were shown in bedrooms and throughout the house. Another popular magazine had a quilt-covered bed on its cover and 64 photographs of quilts, quilt squares, wall-hanging quilts, and quilts used as tablecloths and couch throws illustrated inside. Yet another magazine included a two-page advertisement for information to instruct step-by-step -step how you can create the heirloom bed quilts you've always dreamed of owning, as beautiful as your great-grandmother had. Charles Kuralt's nationally televised news program devoted a segment to a group of mountain quilters. Newspapers around the country carry pictures and stories about local quilt shows regularly. The current renaissance of interest in quilts is not without precedence. In the early 1930s, Carrie Hall and Rose Kretzinger wrote in the Romance of the Patchwork Quilt in America. 
The whole country is quilt conscious. The newspapers report every quilt show with glowing headlines. Without money for costly diversions, the women have turned to a revival of quilt making. Anything so intimately bound up in the history of a country will reappear from time to time in popularity. Grandmother's Flower Garden and the Quilt Shirt, the old and the new. While we were in the process of photographing this Grandmother's Flower Garden quilt at the Museum of Appalachia, we had several onlookers, including Dr. Jimmy Kyle III. The interesting and coincidental aspect of Jimmy's visit at that particular time was that his shirt was decorated with a quilt square. Jimmy, a veterinarian in nearby Clinton, explained that his quilt shirt was made by Jill Bach, wife of his friend H. Risley Bach, a lawyer in New Madrid, Missouri. This new use for the quilt square, the bear's paw in this case, is indicative of the seemingly unlimited influence which the American quilt is having on society today. The quilt was made by Kate Stooksbury, who is discussed in another chapter. Quilt's Home and Dr. William Acuff. The home shown here is that of our longtime friends, Dr. William Acuff and his wife, Sandra. It is located in rural Knox County, Tennessee. Bill, who is former chief of staff for the University of Tennessee Hospital and a well-known Knoxville surgeon, has ancestral roots in rural East Tennessee and in Missouri, where he was reared. He has restored the pioneer period log home and grounds shown above from a ruinous state to its present grandeur. As one might expect, it is filled with antiques and country furnishings, including a variety of old and new quilts which serve as part of the decor and also are used on the beds in a most practical manner. Sandra took these quilts off the children's beds for us to photograph. The green and yellow quilt shown on the left was purchased by Bill from Guy Bowers of Greenville in Upper East Tennessee. Green County, the area from which Guy collected, is a rich farming region heavily influenced by early German families from Pennsylvania. It has produced some of the state's finest antiques. The center quilt with the tulip pattern was purchased from a roadside stand in Sevier County near the Smoky Mountains. According to information they received at the time, it was made about 1920 by the family from whom they bought it, the Carters. The star pattern quilt shown at right was made in the late 1970s by Mrs. Eva McCarter, who lives at the foot of the Great Smoky Mountains near Cosby in the extreme eastern part of Tennessee. Tom and Nancy Walton are a classic example of a modern-day couple who have chosen to live amidst furnishings, artifacts, and mementos of the past. Their large country home is filled with old items, and no one can say their home looks drab, cold, or formidable, as some are wont to say regarding the use of antiques in modern homes. Their use of dozens of colorful and artistically designed quilts is an example of the old now occupying an honored place in the lives of a modern-day couple. Tom and Nancy Walton acquired this quilt at a public auction on May 1, 1982 from an old home place located near the upper East Tennessee town of Johnson City. It appeared that many of the relics from this old farm homestead dated to the mid-1800s or earlier. The quilt, however, is probably a turn-of-the-century product. From the trash pile to an elegant resting place. The beauty of this quilt brightens one of Tom and Nancy Walton's bedrooms. Nancy is shown here with the quilt she acquired from a modern-day quilt maker a few miles north of Knoxville. While looking over the new quilts, Nancy happened to notice this quilt in one of the back bedrooms. It was being used as a bedspread by one of the daughters. Upon inquiry, Nancy learned that the previous owners of the house had left it, along with other old quilts, apparently considering them to be worthless. It is a cross-stitch embroidery, probably made from a pre-designed quilt kit. The quilt folded on the chest is Goose Tracks. It was bought by the Waltons from an old Davis homestead on Sevierville Pike, located between Sevierville and Knoxville. The back is made of feed sacks. Tennessee Sampler, How a Quilt is Born this most unusual and highly symbolic quilt was made by the authors of Tennessee Quilting, Designs Plus Patterns, Judy Elwood, Joyce Tennery, and Alice Richardson. Each of the 15 squares was designed by them or by other Tennessee quilters, and each represents some significant or interesting aspect of Tennessee history and culture. 
The ideal conceived by Alice Richardson was to formulate and illustrate these commemorative type patterns so that other quilters may take any one or any combination of them and incorporate them into a quilt. To this end, all these patterns are illustrated in their book. Although the quilt was finished only in 1982, it has already been exhibited in Knoxville at the World's Fair, at the McClung Museum, the National Quilt Show in New Orleans, the North Carolina Quilt Symposium, and several other quilt shows and shops. The 15 patterns, starting with the top row from left to right, are named and described as follows. Number one, since Oak Ridge is nicknamed the energy capital of the world, it comes as no surprise that the Tennessee energy pattern was chosen by a group of Oak Ridgers to be the first pattern of the quilt. This original design is by Alice Richardson. Number two, Tennessee Cherokee Indians represents those natives who occupied much of what is now the state of Tennessee when the first whites arrived. Some of the symbols included in this pattern by Alice Richardson are based on actual Cherokee designs. Number three, also by Alice Richardson, this is called Tennessee Spring Glory. The center portion represents the flower pod or seed. The middle section, the flowering stage, and the outer section represents the leaves. Number four, the TVA turbines is in commemoration of the Tennessee Valley Authority whose headquarters is in nearby Knoxville and whose first dam, Norris, was built in the same county where Oak Ridge is located. This pattern was designed by Joyce Tenery. Number five, the Tennessee Mockingbird pattern is a tribute to one of the most remarkable and cherished of all birds. The Mockingbird is the official Tennessee state bird. Number six, Memphis Cotton, is an endeavor to pay respect to the southern parts of Middle and West Tennessee and to Memphis, which has traditionally been a central shipping point for raw cotton. Both these patterns were designed by Alice Richardson. Number seven, the tulip tree, is taken from the tulip poplar, which the writer believes grows taller, straighter, and larger than any other tree in the state. It was far and away the favorite tree of the pioneers for building their cabins and other buildings. For these and other reasons, it was chosen to be Tennessee's state tree. Its imposing scientific name means the lily tree that bears tulips. Indeed, its early spring flowers do resemble tulips, hence the name tulip poplar. This pattern was designed by Judy Elwood. Number eight, the Tennessee walking horse pattern was designed by Beverly Orbello in commemoration of this world famous breed of horses. The Tennessee walking horse national celebration is held each year in Shelbyville. Number nine, mountain laurel is one of East Tennessee's most beautiful flowering plants blooming in profusion in the higher elevations in late spring and early summer. This Tennessee mountain laurel pattern was designed by Jane McCullough of Oak Ridge. Number 10, the Tennessee dogwood pattern is a reminder of the many dogwood trees which thrive in the forest of this region. Knoxville is billed as the dogwood capital of the nation and sponsors an elaborate and protracted celebration each spring called the Dogwood Arts Festival. Number 11, the Volunteers of Tennessee pattern was designed by Joyce Tenery and is based on the Tennessee state flag design. Tennessee is called the Volunteer State because more than twice as many men volunteered for both the War of 1812 and the Mexican War as were called. Number 12, Betts Ramsey, a well-known quilt authority from Chattanooga, designed this Tennessee tulip pattern. Number 13, Tennessee Dancing Squares was designed by Alice Richardson as a tribute to old-time square dancing and traditional mountain music. No state has been so involved with folk, mountain, traditional, bluegrass, and country music as has the state of Tennessee. Number 14, Tennessee Mineshaft was designed by Jane McAuliffe of Oak Ridge. This one is particularly appropriate for this area since Anderson County has traditionally been the number one coal producing county in the state. Number 15, Tennessee Water Wheel is a reminder of the countless thousands of water mills which dotted the countryside of the state, especially the more mountainous regions. Perhaps 90% of these mills were devoted to grinding corn into meal used for making cornbread, the basis for all three mills. In later years, the water wheel was used for grinding wheat, powering lathes, and other equipments, and even for producing hydroelectricity. 
We'll stop right there. Fascinating. Don't you want to know where that last is? I wonder what happened to it and if it's in a museum, if one of those ladies that helped design it, if they have it, it makes you wonder what happened to it. And really interesting, all the different different squares and then what they each represent. Of course, you know, especially if you lived in the state of Tennessee. I live really close to Tennessee, but I'm not in Tennessee. And I was actually born in Tennessee. I actually was born in Tennessee. So really interesting. I'd like to know where that quilt is. And I'd also like to know, you know, he said they were doing it. They wrote the book. They had a book and the ladies that uh, were doing it there. And especially sounds like the Richardson lady was probably the one in charge. But that they were hopeful that other people might look at that quilt and make one like it or some combination of it. So it makes you wonder, like the Tennessee walking horse, did somebody decide they loved that squire and then make a whole quilt out of that? or the Mountain Laurel or one of the others. So really uh, interesting one there at the end. The very first quilt though that he talked about in this section of the book, the Maddie Carter, now that was a beautiful, beautiful quilt, but had such a, a sad story about it too with the cyclone and interesting that they called it, he, he even, um, John Rice, and maybe he called it Cyclone because A.P. Carter had wrote that song, and that's what they were called then, Cyclone. You know, today we would just say Tornado, or if you're Katie, you'd just say Nader, and she calls them Nader. But that was a, a really beautiful quilt, but just a really sad story, too, to go with it. And not just her daughter, of course, but those other uh, people that had lost their lives in that disaster. Nanny Brown's The Lone Star, that was an interesting quilt because of it being the superstition that you couldn't just give it to someone. You had to had to do something to alter it a little bit. So she added some more stars to it before she gave it to her daughter. That was really sweet and really sweet that um, she embroidered her name on it, but the daughter didn't realize that till the mother had passed away. And then that was the last quilt that she made. Or, or maybe she done that at the very end when she added those stars and then she added the her name too, embroidery. That's really sweet. Uh, but interesting, that reminds me of like the superstition about you can't really give someone a knife. You have to, uh, it'll cut your friendship. You have to sell it to them, maybe for a penny or something like that. Uh, interesting how superstitions get started. That one was really interesting too because she used those discarded scraps from the shirt t-shirt factories. And, you know, makes you even now wish you could go back in time and say, what's wrong with you people? If those are scraps... Why do you not just let people take them home? Why pile them up in a big pile and make it difficult? Why don't you just make it easy? If you're going to throw them away anyway, just make it easier for the people to get it. You know, said they didn't want people to, to take them necessarily. They wanted them to be thrown away, but they did pile them in a big pile. And it was probably the local uh, management that said, oh, who cares? Those ladies are out there going through the scrap pile. We'll just leave them. Uh, but interesting that that's where they were getting their cloth and a really frugal way to get it for sure. I liked that part a lot. But my favorite quilt in this part, you can probably guess already which one. My favorite one is the one that John Rice found over in the unfloored part of his parents' house, a pap striped suit quilt. That was my favorite one. It wasn't that it was that lovely or anything. But I love thinking about all the members of that family that slept under it. Nine pounds, that was like one of the, today you can buy those weighted blankets. People say they make them feel comforted when they sleep under them. I've heard they're supposed to help you if you have aches and pains and things like that. Um, I kind of get smothery, so I don't know if I could do that. I have to throw back the covers every once in a while during the night. So I don't know if I could do a quilt that heavy. But I love thinking about that uh, and the people that made it and his family, John Rice's family. But I love all those little pieces of the, you know, like the, the daddy saying, hey, the, why, there's my suit. I just love that. I absolutely love it. And then how wonderful that I'm so glad John Rice, even his own family, went that day. And then he, you know, seen that over in the rafters and got over there and got it. Because if he hadn't pulled it out, his daddy probably would have never seen it again, maybe. And, and then he would have never heard that great story about how the, the man that had moved, moved off up north would come back and in his nice expensive clothes and how his brother had bought one of the suits one time and then he ended up wearing it too for a long time and you could tell he's real proud of that suit said everywhere he went people bragged on it so i just adore that so that's my favorite quilt those are though to me those are the quilts that speak to my heart i think the the patterns like that very first one and the uh, lone star one beautiful beautiful but those just 
uh, utilitarian ones that people used every day to cover up with, whether they were sick or well or kids or uh, grown-ups or elderly people. Those are the ones that really, really just tear at my heartstrings, ones that seem really extra special to me. And then, you know, John Rice talks about the popularity of quilts. So when he wrote this book in the 80s, I'm sure there was like a revival. I would say that there is, I don't know that it ever really goes away, but like quilts are really big right now too. I have a lot of friends who quilt and uh, talk about, you know, their patterns and things like that. So I think quilts are, um, I don't know if you would say that they're having a heyday again right now or if it's just that they kind of never went away since he's talked about this during the 80s. And maybe they never went away, period. You know, maybe it was just uh, thinking about the magazines he talked about. Maybe that's it. It's just that suddenly the media kind of, oh, let's talk about the quilts. And and then it, that they kind of go away. But quietly, while they went away to focus on something else, the people that quilt and that are in the quilting community are still just going strong. So anyway, nice to know John Rice noticed that the quilts were still popular and people were still quilting, and I certainly noticed that today, so all these years later, so that's still a, still a really good thing. I hope you'll leave a comment and tell me what you enjoyed about this part of the book, and we're getting kind of close to the, to the end, but I hope you'll drop back by next Friday and we'll see, see what he talks about then. I'm not sure how many more readings from this book we'll have. It may be, maybe two, maybe three, but at least probably two more. And then we'll be finished with this book and we'll have to find another one to read.